right, well, today's a little bittersweet for me today because for seven months we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians, and today we're closing the book. We're going to be finished with 1 Corinthians, and for all this time we've kind of gotten accustomed to hearing Paul speak into our hearts, Paul speaking into our lives, and, and we're going to kind of transition and move away from that starting next week. So I'm, gotta, I'm kind of going to miss Paul a little bit. I'm going to miss his... I'm going to miss his straightforwardness. I'm going to miss his, his challenging remarks to each one of us. I'm going to miss him basically calling out the church and telling the church to stand up and quit getting sidetracked and stay focused on the mission that God's called you to. That's kind of what Paul's done for, well, for us for seven months. That's what Paul has done for 16 chapters in the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you've got your Bibles, well, I hope you do, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians, the last chapter, chapter 16. Now again, for 16 chapters, Paul has been encouraging this church. He's been teaching this church in Corinth and trying to, to encourage them to get back on track and stop getting swayed and stop fussing and stop fighting and stop being pulled in different directions. And he's basically going to tell this church to get focused on what Jesus has called you to do. In fact, in, in chapter 1, he says this to begin his letter. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize. He says, I didn't want to get sidetracked. He says, this is what Christ told me to do. But to preach the gospel. Paul says, Jesus has come to me and, and challenged me and, and, and made me come to, to do one thing, to, to stay focused on preaching the gospel. Paul says, I cannot afford to get sidetracked. I, kind of, I cannot afford to, to get misdirected. I'm here for one purpose, and the purpose is to preach the gospel. And now, so that's how he began his letters. And for the last 15 chapters, he's been telling the church that same one message. He's been saying, listen, you don't need to be fussing about who's the best leader. You don't need to be fighting about who has the best spiritual gift. He says, you need to make sure your marriage is right. You need to make sure your giving is okay. And he says, all these things are, are, are secondary. He says, what I'm trying to get you to know and what I'm trying to get you to, to come to realize is there is one mission that you've got to be sold out on. There's one purpose I want you to challenge. And he says, and that is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for 16 chapters, he's been talking about basically what we're going to talk about today. He's going to talk about the mission of the church. What is the mission of the church? He told us at the very beginning in chapter 1, I didn't come to baptize, I came to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel has got to be essential to us. And for 15 chapters after that, he kind of took all of their arguments, he took all of their fussing, he took all of their fighting, and he, and he kind of blew up all their arguments, and he kind of brought it down to this one central message. We must be serious. We must be focused on the mission that Jesus has given us. And that's how Paul's going to close his chapter today. That's how we're going to close this book today as well. He closes this letter by reminding the church, keep the mission priority. For us, I hope that we can get the same message that Paul told the Corinthians. I pray that we won't be distracted. I pray that we won't get sidetracked. I pray that some of us won't get satisfied and just sit. I pray that we would be serious about the mission that God has challenged us. That we would keep the mission our priority. So as we come to this final chapter, before we get into chapter 16, I want to remind you how Paul closed chapter 15. So if you've still got your finger there in chapter 16, look at the last verse in, verse, in chapter 15. Paul says, Therefore, which is kind of a summary statement, therefore, since we've been teaching about this for 15 chapters, therefore, since the resurrection is essential, therefore, since Jesus did die on the cross and raise from the dead, therefore, since Jesus is one day going to come back and resurrect our dead bodies so that we can live forever in heaven with him, therefore, since all of that is true, he says, my dear brothers, be steadfast. Be steadfast. Get serious. Be steadfast immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work. Not in my work, not in your work, but make sure we are excelling in what matters. Excelling in the Lord's work. Why? Knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Which implies there's some labor that we do that is in vain, right? There are some things that we do that 
really don't matter. So he's trying to, again, redirect us to remind us to the mission that God has called us to. And he says, and when you're focused on the mission, realize that that labor is not in vain. It has a good outcome. It has a beneficial outcome. It has fruit. Fruit that will remain for eternity. So I want to challenge us as Paul challenges this church. How is our mission? How are we focused on the essentials? In chapter 16, he, last week we, we talked about how he, he affects our giving and how we're to give towards the mission. And our giving is a result of what God has done for us, but our giving is not just for what God has done for us. Our giving is what God's going to do through us to others. And we're giving so that the mission of God moves forward. We're giving so that other churches may be planted. We're giving so that other people may know Christ. We're giving because people beforehand gave so that we would know Christ. Praise God that somebody gave that I would know Jesus. In fact, for me, it was interesting. I, I was actually saved by watching TV. How about that? I love it. Cool. Did you didn't, y'all know that about me? I was actually watching a television show. And as I was watching a television show, check this out. You won't believe it when I say it, whether there was a pirate who was giving the gospel. It was a kid's program, okay? There was a pirate, and he had an eye patch, and he was explaining the gospel message. And as he explained the gospel message, there I was as a nine-year-old boy watching this television program, and that's when the Lord convicted me of my sin, and I realized that I needed Jesus as my Savior. So there in my living room floor, I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior. Thank God someone gave money for that TV program. I could have been saved in a church service, sure, but I wasn't. I was saved in the living room, watching TV. Maybe that's why I still like TV so much. Praise God, somebody gave towards that. But let me tell you, some of you were saved in church. Some of you were saved in Bible school. Some of you were saved in church camp. Praise God that we realize that the mission is essential, and we're here to buy in, to participate in the mission that God has given us. We're not satisfied. We're not sit, sit, sitting here and just waiting. We're moving forward. Paul had this plan. He understood the essential importance of the mission. In fact, I've read it to you a while ago at the very beginning. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 17, he says, I didn't come to be baptized. I came to preach the gospel. My purpose is, 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 is meaningful. I'm, I'm moving forward. He was focused on the mission. Let me tell you three things Paul always did if you'll study his books that he read, that he wrote. The first thing Paul always did is that he was serious about evangelizing the lost. He was serious about seeing lost people saved. He was serious about seeing people who were far from God to be made friends of God. He was serious about people who did not know Jesus to tell them about Jesus. Always, up, always you see Paul going from place to place and always what he was doing was telling people about Jesus. He was serious about evangelism. Paul wanted every man, every woman, every young person, every child to experience in their lives what he had experienced. That God can change a person. And he changed Paul dramatically. He may have changed you dramatically. And I pray that the passion that Paul had would invade us as a church. I pray that the passion that Paul had would, would just would overwhelm, overwhelm us. And we must do what Paul did. We must be serious about evangelizing the lost. There's people all around us that are lost and going to hell. There are people in our schools. There are people in our colleges. There are people in our workplaces. Our neighbors. Some of you are even old family members. If they were to die today, they would not go to heaven. And it must break our heart as it broke Paul's. If you just see Paul and if you sense Paul, if you hear Paul, he's serious about evangelizing the lost. The second thing Paul always did, Paul always was encouraging to the saints. What am I mean by encouraging to the saints? Paul knew that believers, he, he knew that church people, he knew that Christians needed somebody to help them grow. He needed somebody to encourage them. That's why I love our mission statement up here. You know, not only are we about making disciples, which is evangelizing the lost, we're also about maturing disciples. Once you come to Jesus, now it's time to grow up in Jesus. 
The problem in churches for many times, they, they get people to come to Jesus, but they never get people to grow up in Jesus. It's time for us to grow up in Jesus. We're supposed to be mature believers, mature disciples. And Paul does this in his writings, this entire book of 1 Corinthians. Paul was dedicating himself to grow up the church, to grow up the believers, to mature them so that they would follow Jesus with their lives. So they, he evangelized the lost. He edified the church. A, a th third thing is, is or the, he encouraged the saved. The third thing is he edified the church. He's, he, he made the church a priority. Paul wanted to make sure that the church was strong. He wanted to make sure that the church was obedient to Christ. He wanted to make sure that the church was beautiful. That the church was a priority. So you see that in all of Paul's writings. So again, when we come to the end of chapter 16, listen as Paul talks about that. Paul wants us to repent, basically, of our own agenda and get on board with Jesus' mission. In fact, I think, sadly, the greatest hindrance to the mission of God is, is us. <laughs> instead of following Christ and instead of following His mission, we get sidetracked and we do our own thing. And Paul's going to remind us here. So again, now let me get into the text. That's enough introduction, right? Let me get into the text and let's figure out what Paul's got to say to us from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. Paul starts off by saying, I will come to you after I pass through Macedonia. For I'll be traveling through Macedonia and perhaps I'll remain with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I go. Now, I don't want to see you now, just in passing, for I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord allows. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a wide door for effective ministry has opened for me. Yet many oppose me. Do you see the very first thing we see here in this section of Scripture is Paul's plans. That's the first kind of part of your, your notes there, if you're filling in your your outline you see Paul's plans and what Paul's plans are simply to this is listen I'm willing to go and I'm willing to do anything that Jesus calls me to do and anywhere Jesus calls me to go the first step of being on mission for Christ is just simply being willing how many of us right now would be just willing to do whatever God called us to do if it's to pack up and go somewhere else we're ready to pack up and go somewhere else if it's, if it's just to open our mouth to our next-door neighbor, we're ready to open our mouth to our next-door neighbor. We're ready to do whatever he has called us to do. That's what Paul's doing here. Paul's saying, listen, I'm making plans, and it's okay to have plans. I'm making plans, and I'm making plans to come see you. In fact, I'd even like to stay with you. In fact, I'd like to even encourage you a little more. But then he adds this little phrase there. He says, if the Lord permits... I'm making these plans, but all my plans are really dependent on what God wants. You know, I think a lot of times we don't add that last part to our lives, do we? A lot of times we make plans, but our plans are never if the Lord permits. Our plans are just that, our plans. And what we've got to come to understand is this. We have got to be open to whatever God is wanting to do in our lives. We've got to be open to wherever he wants to lead in our lives. We've got to just simply be able to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Do whatever you wish with me. And again, that doesn't mean you don't make plans. He was making plans. But what it does mean, you might be willing to change your plans when the Lord changes your plans. We must follow the Lord. I love this phrase. You look at what it says there at the end of, of verse 3 and 4. I, I love what it says. He, he says, now, I, I don't want to go in passing, or uh, not three or four. Let me drop down a little bit more. Let's see, what is that? Verse 7, 7 and 8. 7 and 8, he says, I don't want you to, to see you now just in passing, for I hope to spend some time with you. Again, here's his plans, if the Lord allows. Now, in verse 8, but I'm going to stay here in Ephesus for a little while. Now, why is Paul going to stay in Ephesus for a little while? I thought he wanted to come see the Corinthians. Look at why he's staying in Ephesus. But I'm going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because... A wide door of effective ministry has opened for me. God is moving in this area. And because God is moving, I'm staying here for a while. A wide door of effective 
ministry. Can I, in fact, I've got this marked up in my Bible, and it's kind of a prayer that I pray often or whatever, say, God, send me to a wide open door. Let me have an effective ministry. Can we just stop for a moment and let's look at where God is working and let's get involved in the work that God is already doing? Paul says this. Paul says, look at where God is working. Look at what God is doing. And I'm going to stay there until God is finished. That's That's a great ministry model for our church. A great ministry model for our church is to look at where God is working, get involved in what God is doing, and when God leaves, we leave. But when God's working, we work. Let's get beside God and work alongside God and do what God is doing among the ministry of our church, among the ministry of this community. Where is God at work? Where is the open door? All right, wide door, as this translation says. Where's the the wide door? Where is the effective ministry being taken place right now? By the way, this is also true in reverse. What I mean by reverse, when there's a closed door, when the ministry is not effective, that's when it's time to walk away. I know a lot of churches that, that continue doing ministry, and the door was shut a long time ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I read a book one time. He says, the best, thing to do of a, the best thing to do on a dead horse is dismount. A lot of times, churches will ride a dead horse over and over, right? Listen, when a ministry is dead, move on. And find out where God is working. And that's where you should be plugged in. That's, but I love this ministry. Okay. It's dead. Move on. Find out where God is working. Find out where the open door is. And get involved with that. That's what Paul's doing right here. I want to come see you. I want to come be involved with you. But right now, God is doing some great things in Ephesus. And I just can't leave. Again, we make plans, but we have to be open to what God wants to do in our lives. You know, Paul was serious about the mission of God, but one thing I love about Paul, he understood that he couldn't do it all himself. Paul could not reach the world for Christ by himself. Paul understood this. You know what Paul needed? Paul needed help in the ministry. Paul needed help. This is a a great lesson for us as a church. The pastor, the ministry staff is never meant to do all the ministry of the church. Never meant to do that. Your life group leader, your Sunday school teachers, never meant to do all the ministry of the church. We need help in the ministry. I realize that we can't reach the the world for Christ by ourselves. We need help in the ministry. While we were over in India, we lived in Madhya Pradesh, which was a state right in the middle. The city was Bhopal, and in the state of Madhya Pradesh, there were 72 million people in our state. And in 72 million people that were in our state, we had six missionary families that were called to reach those 72 million people. Guess what we found out real quick? These six missionary families were not going to be able to reach 72 million people. It was not going to happen. You know what we needed? We needed help. You want to feel overwhelmed? Get dropped off in a city of nine million people. Your family and a single girl are the only people there trying to reach a city of nine million for Christ. You want to feel overwhelmed? Can't do it. It's not possible. The people are too many. But you can break that down. It doesn't have to be 72 million in a state. It doesn't have to be 9 million in a city. You know what it can be? 17,000 in Kirksville. I realize I'm not talented enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough energy for even the 17,000 in Kirksville. We need help in the ministry, which is why God gave us the church. 
because we were never intended to do it by ourselves. God gave us the church so the church could get to work. God gave us the church so the church could do the ministry and focus on the mission. Paul understood this. Paul understood that the mission was not a one-man mission. He needed help. So one of the strengths of Paul's ministry is that he showed appreciation and he lifted up those who have helped him. Helped him. And I just want to look over and, and see some lessons from these people who have helped Paul in the ministry. The first we come across to is, is Timothy. And one thing that I was encouraged by Timothy, I, I saw the youthfulness of Timothy. You know, you, you see this energy that Timothy brought. You see, Timothy was a, a young man, and a young man brings energy. Let me tell you, I love our children's ministry that's down there right now. I love our youth ministry. I love our college ministry. You know why? Because they bring energy. Some of you need to hang out with some of them. Because they bring energy. Let's be honest, sometimes it's so energetic that after the time that you've hung out with them, you're ready for a nap. But they bring energy. You go volunteer to our children's ministry down there, and on a Sunday morning you can hear them sing, and you can see them uh, just be hungry for God's Word, and you'll leave tired, but you'll leave full because of the energy that they have brought. We need that kind of energy. We need the youthfulness of Timothy. Let's keep reading. I want you to see what it says beginning in verse 10. He says, if Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear from you. Is that not a great thing to first? Paul, again, I told you Timothy was this young minister who was coming to Corinth, this established church. And the first thing Paul says is, listen, don't scare him. Isn't that funny that Paul had to say that to a church? I'm sending to you to this young guy, and the very first thing I want you to be reminded of is, don't scare him. Don't frighten him. Don't push him away. Make sure that he has nothing to fear from you because he's doing the Lord's work. Just because he is young doesn't mean he's not effective. So don't push him away. Don't shut him up. Make sure you don't scare him because he's doing what some of you aren't. He's doing the Lord's work. You know, I love him. I'm so grateful for Austin here, our, our youth pastor. I'm grateful that he preached for me a couple of weeks ago. And I'm grateful that you've not put fear in him and hopefully you've come beside him and you've encouraged him. Hopefully you've come and you've tried to lift him up and you've tried to push him forward because he's doing the Lord's work. We're not here to push him down. We're here to lift him up. I hope that you're doing that. I hope that you can see young people in our church and I hope that you're not trying to push them down. I hope that you're trying to lift them up. Listen, the young people of our church are not the church for tomorrow. The young people of our church are the church of today. They're the ones who matter. They're the ones who are effective. They're the ones who are out working. Don't push them down. God called Timothy to preach. And Paul says, don't hush him. Lift him up. Encourage him. Because he goes on, he says, because he's doing the Lord's work just as I am. He's not any different than I am. Verse 11, therefore, no one should look down on him. Send him on a way in peace. So that he can come to me. For I'm expecting him with the brothers. He says, listen, don't, don't look down on him. Instead, encourage him. I wish I prayed for this, that our church would just be that kind of a church. A church that encourages young people. A church that lifts up young people. A church that sees our youth ministry, that sees our children's ministry, that sees our college ministry. And comes up beside it and rises it up and says, we want to equip you. We want to help you. We want you to take on ownership and leadership. Because you matter. Paul saw this in Timothy. And he says, we got a young guy here. Don't make him scared. Don't push him down. Don't shut him up. He's doing the Lord's work just as I am. And if you respect me, you respect him. That's what Paul says. Listen, I understand how hard it can be to be a young minister. I mean, I was pastoring my first church. I was 23 years old. My three deacons' average age were 78. <laughs> I actually had several people, boy, I've been here longer than you've been alive, and I'll be here after you're gone. <laughs> they were right. 
that they loved me and they respected me. They listened. And when I made mistakes, they patted me on the back and said, try again. I love that church, my very first church. I loved it because they understood I was young and they loved me and they knew I was going to mess up, but they loved me anyway. And when I did mess up, they encouraged me. When I preached a message that was, well, the best way I could put it was stupid and bombed, they came up and said, you know what, I got something out of that. They were always so helpful. We should encourage our young people. That's exactly what Paul is doing here with Timothy. But not only do we see Timothy, I want you to keep going. I've only got down to verse 10 and 11. There's so many verses I want to get to. Verse 12, we also see there's Apollos there. And one thing that you see in Apollos is he was just steadfast. I mean, he was immovable. One thing about Apollos, look at what it says in verse 12. And he says, and about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brothers. He was not willing to come now. However, he will come when he has an opportunity. Now, again, I can't speak uh, about Apollos from this passage, but if you go back to Acts chapter 18, we can learn who Apollos is and what he does. In Acts 18, verse 24 and 25, you see who Apollos was and a few things that Apollos was. One, he's a, he was an eloquent speaker. He knew how to speak. The second thing we saw is that he was mighty in the Scriptures. He knew what the Scripture says, and he was consistent with the Scriptures. A third thing is, is that he continued telling people about Jesus. He was an evangelist. And finally, in Acts 18, I love it, he says that he was fervent in the Spirit. Can you imagine working beside a person like that who is grounded in Scripture, who is an evangelist, and who is filled with the Spirit? Paul says, that's the kind of guy I'm working with. That's the kind of guy I'm sending you. I'm sending you somebody who's passionate about the ministry that God's given. Good grief, I would be. I'm hungry. I wish we had 50 people like Apollos in our church that were filled with the Spirit, that were evangelists, and that were focused on the ministry God's given us. If we had 50 people like that, can you imagine what kind of impact we could make in our community? Filled with the Spirit, grounded in the Word, and moving forward with passion and purpose. Paul says, I got helpers like that. Apollos is like that. But Paul keeps going. He says, it's not just that. I've got more people. The, the next one, I've got Stephanas. This is a weird word. Stephanas, I don't know. Look, he says, this is a refreshing kind of guy. Let, let's look at what the Bible says. I love this passage of Scripture, verse 15 through 18. Brothers, you know the household of Stephanas, and they are the first fruits of Achaia. Listen to this. Oh, I love this next part. Look at what it says. And they have devoted themselves to serving the saints. Man, is that not a good kind of person you want to work with? I've got a guy here who's devoted. I've got a guy here who's devoted. What's he devoted to? He's devoted to serving the saints. Do we, know, we just need more servants in our church, don't we? We just need more people who will say, I'm willing to do whatever it is. I'm willing to serve our saints. In fact, I was, had a deacons meeting this morning in our church office, and I loved it because David was just encouraging our deacons. He says, listen, just go out and visit these people. Go out and love them. Go and pray with them. Just go encourage them. I got to thinking about this passage. That's what he tells us to do. Go and serve the saints. I love hearing this about our church, and you guys are great at this, and our life groups are doing wonderful at this. I, I might be visiting someone, and they, they tell me, oh, so-and-so came just this past week and brought this and did this and prayed with me. Just serving one another, encouraging one another. That's what this person did. He says he was devoted to serving the saints. Now, there's a responsibility for the church in this, too. Look at what the church it says. I urge you, now verse 16, I urge you also to submit to such people. And he says, in fact, those are the kind of people that you want to be around. Those are the kind of people you need to listen to. I don't really want to listen to people who aren't interested in serving other people and only worry about serving themselves. He says, you need to submit. You need to follow the people who are willing to work for other people, not for themselves. Submit to other people, not submit to themselves. He says, that's who you really need to be about. Now drop down to verse 18, because I love verse 18 as well. Verse 18 says, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. 
You've heard me preach about this and talk about this before, but that's the kind of people I want to be around. The kind of people I want to be around are the kind of people when I leave, I leave refreshed. Now, let's be honest. Have you ever been around kind of people and they didn't refresh you, but they drained you? Y'all been around those kind of people before? You, you walk away going, oh. Paul says that's not what this kind of, this is the kind of person when you walk away, you feel refreshed. You're glad you went. You glad, you're glad you had that conversation. Again, my favorite illustration, you've heard me say it, as you're walking down the hall and you see somebody coming, is that the person you want to stop and talk to or the person you want to duck and hide away from? He says this is the kind of person that refreshes you. This is the kind of person after you talk with them, after you do ministry with them, after you hang out with them, you leave ah, feeling better than when you came. Again, for us, a lesson. Is this the kind of person you are? Are you the kind of person when people walk away, they're saying, I'm glad I had that conversation? Are you the kind of person say, gosh, I hope I don't see him again? Paul says, they have refreshed me and you. Therefore, recognize such people. Recognize such people. Recognize that they are special. Recognize that they are a help, not a hindrance. We need people to help in our ministry, not hurt our ministry. Well, there's a last one that we see here in the scriptures. We're just reading down verse 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 16, 17, 18, now we turn to verse 19. There's another person here. We see the, the usefulness of Aquila and Priscilla. You see, Paul realized that he was not alone in the mission of God. He had all these people who were helping him. In verse 19, he says, I've got a, a Aquila and Priscilla. He says, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, uh, along with the church that meets in their home. In fact, Aquila and Priscilla, they were so dedicated to the mission of God. They were so dedicated to the purpose that God had given them. They even had a church that met in their home. It says, listen, I, I, it's not about me. It's not about us. We, we are inviting people into our home and we're having church right here among us. What a great couple to have. They became a worship center for the saints. This couple was on mission. Did you hear all these names that Paul was dropping? Paul was name dropping all these people, and he says, listen, here's some people doing this. Here's people doing that. Here's people. These are people who are active. These are people who are working. These are people who are on mission for Christ. I just wonder if Paul was in our church, whose names would he recognize? Paul was on mission in our church. What would he say about you? Is there a category you fall under? Usefulness of Aquila. The refreshing spirit of Stephanus. The youthfulness of Timothy. The steadfastness of Ap Apollos. What would Paul say about you? Well, I want to wrap this session up and I want to close with the way Paul kind of closed. There's one final challenge this is really the final challenge of chapter 16 the final challenge of the book of first corinthians and you kind of hear paul i can almost stand hear him standing and and saying this with the with the authority of some kind of a commander telling us to be serious about the mission god's called us to and the way he does that is he says it in verse 13 and verse 14 so Back up with me to verse 13 and look at what Paul says. This last challenge. He says, be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like a man. Be strong. Your very action must be done with love. I want to break those down just for a minute. Let's look at what Paul says. These actions that we should live out in our life. The very first thing he says was this, be alert. Another translation says, be watchful. Stay awake. 
Maybe sometimes during Sunday morning messages, I need to preach more of stay awake. Be watchful. Believers are, are called to, to stay awake. Believers are called to, to be on watch. What, what are we watching for? We're watching for, are we on mission or not? Are we in line with what Jesus tells us to do or not? Are we serious about what he's called us to do or are we just playing the game? Be alert, be watchful, check it out. See if what you're doing lines up with Scripture. Be on guard. Acts chapter 20, Paul put it this way. Acts chapter 20, beginning verse 29, he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and men will rise up from your own number with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on alert. Remembering that night and day for three years, I didn't stop warning you of each other with tears. He says, listen, if you're not watchful, some people will come and try to pull you away from the mission God has called you to. He says, be on alert. Be watchful to make sure that you're not being strayed away. Be on alert. Make sure you're not being pulled away. Be on alert. Stay awake. Don't let your mission be neglected. One author wrote this he said churches don't die when the world dismisses us as foolish when they pass ungodly legisla legislation or even inflects violent persecution churches die when they deny the gospel of grace when they wrongly believe what really saves us i see churches all around all around this church who do not stand on truth who do not preach the gospel and when you do not stand on truth and when you do not preach the gospel, you're being strayed, you're being pulled away. And when you're being pulled away, you lose power, you lose effectiveness. And Paul says, do not let that happen. Be alert. Be alert. Be on guard. Be watchful. I want you to constantly ask that about this church at First Baptist. Are we on mission are we serious about the gospel? If there's some things that I'm doing as a leader that's pulling us away, you come and slap me in the face and say, Jason, get back to where we need to be. If there are other leaders in our church who are pulling us away, off direction, we need to stand up and say, stop it. This is not what we're called to do. Be on alert. Be watchful. Making sure we are following the mission that God has called us to. Secondly, he says this. He says, stand firm. He says, stand firm in the faith. Now, this is simple. Just know what you believe. It's hard to be watchful if you don't know what you believe. It's hard to, to not be pulled away into a false doctrine if you don't know the true doctrine. He says, stand firm. Know what you believe. And when you know what you believe, stand up for what you believe. Listen, I will fight someone for the gospel because the gospel is what matters. We will not be a church that does not focus on the gospel, that leaves and tries to focus on something else. We're not going to stand for that because Paul says to stand firm in the faith. Stand firm means I'm ready to defend it. Stand firm, I'm ready to take it. Stand firm says bring it on, I'm going to take it. Stand firm in the faith. He says be serious about it. Listen, we guard, we guard the gospel. By standing firm in the faith. This gospel gives me my identity. It gives us our identity. We must never be drawn away from it. We're never drawn away that, listen, I'm a sinner and needed of a Savior. I made mistakes and I messed up and I was full of sin. And I needed Jesus to save me. The gospel is that Jesus came and he lived that perfect life and he died on the cross to pay for the sins that I committed, to pay for the sins that you committed. Jesus died for us. He lived the perfect life we could not live. He died the death for us in our place. He rose from the grave to defeat death, to prove he was who he said he was. And now I follow him. I've committed my life to him. That's the gospel which we cannot go away from 
We are not good people who just need to get better. We are bad people in need of a Savior. We need Jesus, and He is the answer to everything. And we cannot be pulled away from that. He says, stand firm. Third thing he says is to be strong. Depending on what translation you read, I think the one I read to you earlier said, act like a man. (laughs) Don't be childish. Be brave, another translation says. Be brave, be strong. Again, this is that inner spiritual strength. It means grow up. It's what Paul is basically saying. Act like a man. Grow up. Don't be a baby. I've been a part of some churches that needed to hear that message. Anybody ever been? I've been a part of some churches, and I've talked to some Christians who just simply, you just simply, the best argument you could give them would just simply be this. Grow up. Grow up in the gospel. Grow up in the faith. Stop acting childish about stuff that just don't matter. Paul says, grow up, be strong, have the courage to obey what Scripture says, have the courage to obey what Jesus says, and follow what he says. Joshua says this, Joshua chapter 1, above all, be strong and very courageous to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. So that you'll have success wherever you go. This book of instruction, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You're to recite it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you'll prosper and succeed in whatever you do. If we're going to be strong We better be strong in the Word of God. Be focused on the Word of God and what it says. If we're going to stand firm, we stand firm in the gospel of what Jesus has given us. And the things that don't matter, guess what? Don't matter. (laughs) The things that don't matter just don't matter. Let's don't waste breath on things that don't matter. And let's waste breath, not waste breath, but let's use our breath on things that do matter. Paul says, be strong. And here's the last thing, and I'll finish with this. He says, be loving. (laughs) Because what I've said lately, you know, I'll fight for the gospel. I'm going to stand, be strong. Sometimes a lot of churches are really good at being strong and standing firm, but they're really bad at being loving. So I think Paul made this last emphasis by saying, listen, you can stand firm and you can stand strong, but you know what you must do? You must be loving. Look at what he says there in verse 14 at the end of it. The end of verse 14, he says, I thought I was going to have it on the screen, but if not, I put it on my Bible. Verse 14 says, your every action must be done with love. Everything you say, everything you do, your every action if you're going to stand strong, stand strong in love. If you're going to be, stand firm, stand firm in love. Look at, notice the broadness of this. Let every action, all that we do, because here's the truth. We guard the gospel by the love that we show. What does Jesus say? The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God. What's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, as Jesus says, you'll know that they're my disciples by how they love one another. Love seems to be very important, doesn't it? And again, as churches, a lot of times we're very strong, but not very loving. Listen, First Baptist, may we be a church that is loving. There's a place to stand strong. There's a place to stand firm. We're supposed to do that. But may we do it in love. May we love one another. May we love our community. May we love this city. May we love those who are unlovable. Paul says it in Ephesians 4. For him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth 
of our body for the building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Listen, I pray that you would do this, that you would love one another. I pray that you would look around and you would hug one another, that you would love one another, that you'd shake hands with one another, that you'd kiss one another. Well, verse 20. Put up verse 20 back up there. It's on that last screen that you just had up. Not only did verse 14 say that everything we do must be done in love, verse love, verse 20 says this, and all you brothers greet you, greet each other with a holy kiss. <laughs> Again, just love one another. Just love one another. Love one another so much that we would do anything for one another. God has called us to this. You know, the greatest thing we can do for anyone, the greatest love we can show for anyone is to share the gospel with them. It's to tell people the way to heaven. To tell people the hope that they can have in Jesus. So I pray that we at First Baptist, we would be a church that loves. And the way we love is we're true about what the gospel says. That we are sinners in need of a Savior. That Jesus is the answer. And that if you trust Him and that if you follow Him, He will forgive your sins and bring you into a right relationship with God. Listen, if you're here today and maybe you're visiting with us or you're here today and you just continue visiting and continue showing, I want to encourage you right now, if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus as your Savior, come today to do that. Follow Him. Trust in Him today. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is our message. This is our mission. This is our purpose. May we never be pulled away from it. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I want to pray right now for our church. God, I'm grateful and I love this place. I love these people. God, I'm grateful that you have called us to this city. God, I'm, I'm thankful that Within this body of believers, we have people who are committed to obeying you, committed to following you, committed to living out this purpose of reaching our city, reaching our state, reaching our nation, ultimately reaching the world for Christ. We also understand that there's no way we can do it alone. We need help. God, I need help. The ministry staff needs help. The teachers need help. God, I pray for the members that are sitting in our church right now that they would stand firm. I pray they would stand up for what they believe. That they would speak out the truth of the gospel. God, we are not ashamed of this gospel. It is the power of salvation. It has the ability to change lives. It's changed my life. So God, may we tell others that truth, that gospel. May we be passionate about the mission that Jesus has given us. We pray this in his name. Amen.